Prison is a place or condition of forcible restraint or captivity. A place where one can get worn out or get reformed. Prisons need not always be a physical location. Anger, fear, regret, bitterness, bondage, these are prisons as well. In this message, we take a look at how to make that journey from prison to praise. Good morning, everyone. I'd like us to turn to Ezekiel chapter 37, please, before we make our declaration. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 37, and uh, this is how it reads. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me down, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. Verse 3, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. So the hand of the Lord brings Ezekiel out in the spirit, and he sees this great valley, and this valley is full of bones, and the Bible makes it a point to record that they, they were very dry which means that there was no life in those bones. There was no life at all. And the Lord asks Ezekiel a question. And whenever God asks a question, you know that he's not asking so that he doesn't know, but he's asking the question with a purpose so that he can, does, he can do something in us. He can bring us some revelation. So he asks Ezekiel this question, can these bones live? And Ezekiel, he doesn't even bother to answer directly. He says, Lord, you know. You know the situation. These are bones. These are very dry. There's no life in them. So you know. And obviously, the answer is no. These bones cannot live. But then, God asks him to prophesy or speak over those bones. And he says, Speak to these bones, prophesy to these bones. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I will put sinews, bring flesh, put breath in you, and you shall live. So God's word comes, and it's totally opposite of what the situation is. Completely different. Totally opposite. You see these bones, they are dry, and there's no life. But God says, you speak my word, and I will put my breath in them, and I will take these bones through a process, and these bones shall live. And when we read the end of the chapter, we see the mighty army standing up, and a picture of the house of Israel. And so also in our lives, you know, God asks us some questions, and we see, look, God, this is an impossible situation. This is a dead-end situation, God. And God's word comes. And God says, you know, you speak my word. And sometimes we wonder, God, how can I speak my word? Because in the natural, I know that there's no remedy to the situation. It's totally far gone. Lord, how can I speak my word? But Ezekiel said, says, I prophesied as I was commanded. Now, many times, God's word comes to us to encourage us, to nurture us, to convict us, to refresh us. But it's also a command to speak that word over life situations, to speak that word maybe over our families, to speak that word. And that word seems totally opposite to what is going on in our lives. 
but it's a command. Can we be faithful to speak that word and see the end that is intended by the Lord as we declare the word of God? Amen. And that's why we declare God's word and we make it a lifestyle to speak the word of God over life situations and over our own lives. Shall we all stand and hold the Bible um, in our hands and declare this and make it loud and make it, you know, mix your faith with it and say, this is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands with the person next to you and say, you know, prophesy. Shake hands with the person next to you and say, prophesy. Prophesy just means to speak forth. Speak forth as you hear from God. Prophesy. Speak over your life. Speak over your situation. You know, we've been looking at the series Foundations, and we've been looking at many foundational teachings from the Word of God, and uh, we'll continue on uh, those teachings from next Sunday onwards. Um, today, I'm just going to share a short, uh, you know, encouraging, inspirational message, and uh, I've just titled this From Prison to Praise. I borrowed the title from, you know, the well-known uh, book uh, by the author Merlin Carothers, which goes by the same title, from prison to praise. So, if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to paint a kind of negative picture for some time. Okay, but the end is good. Amen? Amen. So, we're going to talk about prisons. We're going to talk about different prisons and how we end up in them. And it's good that we know that. God's intention is that we move from that place, we move from the place called the prison to a place of praise. And what do we do when we are in that prison? And we're going to look at all that. So, I know uh, we all understand and know what a prison is, but let me just read, um, read some lines on prisons. Prison, a place or condition of forcible restraint or captivity. A place or a condition of forcible restraint or captivity. It is a place where one is lawfully detained, in most cases, for committing unlawful acts, again, in most cases. It is a place where the prisoner is kept to prevent from causing further harm or danger to others or to oneself. It is also a place to bring about reform in the prisoner before being released. In a prison, there are restrictions. Freedom is curtailed. You cannot do what you want to do. You cannot go where you want to go. There is a set time to do everything. Your freedom is curtailed. You might want to walk out, but you cannot. You might try your best, but you cannot. Freedom is curtailed. A prison, not, prison is not always a comfortable place. It may not have the comforts or the luxuries that we might be used to. It's an uncomfortable place. In a prison, people are held captive against their will, most of them. It is possible for one to be worn out physically and otherwise while in prison. And then you're in the place, this physical place, or maybe you're in this condition called a prison. It is highly likely that one can get worn out physically and come to a place of being very passive and broken in our spirit. A prison does that. A prison, sometimes when, it, when there's solitary confinement, it is very difficult, extremely difficult to bear and to go through. And people say that, you know, in solitary confinement, you can even 
lose your sanity very difficult and nobody wants to stay a prisoner indefinitely everyone wants to be free everyone wants to be free so we see that there are different kinds of prisons you know prison we know to be a physical place a secure place where people inside cannot come out without permission unless the doors open we see that a prison you know which has high walls and is heavily guarded and those who are kept captive are captive so it could be a physical place a geographic location sometimes you know prisons are not physical places we might be prisoners of circumstances a circumstance can act like a real physical prison there could be walls looming so high it could be a no win situation it could be a kind of a dead end street but it acts like a prison we want to come out of that situation we try so hard but the walls are very high we try again and again but our will is broken down till we come to that place and say okay i will remain here till we come to a place of being very passive and say whatever happens let it happen we could be prisoners of circumstances which could be as real as a physical place or we could be prisoners in our mind and our attitude anger can put us in a prison prison cell regret can put us in a prison or oh, i wish i studied this you know i had a regret for many many years you know i wish the regret was this i wish i could have done better in my 12th standard i wish i could have done better but then you know things happen there's a lot of healing and fine but some of us might be carrying regrets and that's a prison doesn't allow us to move into all that god has for us in the here and now and in the days ahead i wish i had gone there i wish i had met this person or said or spoken to this i wish i had reconciled all this i wish i could have done that i i wish i could have done that i wish i wish i wish regret is a prison a very real place and regret often leads to bitterness where we feel so bitter where we are so cynical where we lose the ability to feel the love where we lose the ability to even feel god's love sometimes so bitter so hardened and it's a very real place sometimes a a bondage can be a prison maybe it's it's a sin a continued sin and you try so hard but you are in bondage it can be a prison now we are imprisoned for various reasons you know the first reason is this that we could be imprisoned for the sake of righteousness for the sake of righteousness you know you do the right thing and still you're in prison and we're going to look at some people in the bible who did the right thing and yet they were in prison there was a circumstance that held them and we could be in prison because of the enemy you know how many of you know that we have an enemy who is so real as real you know if you believe that god is real if you believe that the word of god is the truth then you should we should also know and believe that we have an enemy who is real yes he is a you know he is a defeated foe he tried his best to keep us from the lord in prisons of wrong beliefs belief systems and so on he kept us so hard but the minute we came to the lord we experienced salvation we enjoyed 
his peace and love, he still tries to keep us from being all that God wants us to be. God has great plans for us. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says that the very thoughts that he has for us is to give us a hope and a future. John 10.10, 10, the Lord Jesus, I have come that you might have life and life in all its fullness, abundant life. And it's not just for a group of people, it's for each one of us washed by the blood of the Lord. And Satan tries his best to keep us in prisons so that we cannot move out, so that we don't enjoy the fullness that God wants for us. So sometimes the enemy, he tries to tempt us and put us on the path and lead us on the path to a prison and take us captive there. Temptation. You know, we think, okay, it's something that I can, you know, I'll get over it. It's something very small. Uh, it's nothing. It's just a white lie or, you know, it's okay. We, we give different words to sin, to kind of justify, to kind of, you know, reduce the impact or reduce the seriousness of it or the magnitude of it. We can give different labels. We can say things like, oh, boys will be boys and so on, you know, men will be men. But the fact is that sin is sin. And the way, when the enemy tempts us, when the enemy trips us down, he, his end, you know, the end that he, that he intends for us, the enemy intends for us, is to keep us in that prison. It's not something, you know, it's, it's not like he's just playing with you. He wants, he's very real. His assignment is to steal, kill, and destroy. So much so that the Lord Jesus had to come and go on the cross to break that power of sin. Amen. He had to do that. So when we play with sin, when we think a temptation is okay, it's not really okay. It's a very serious thing. So the enemy tempts us and puts us on that path and takes us to that prison. The enemy also, you know, in order to keep us in a prison, he continually, continuously accuses us. You know, I, I was in um, APC East a, a few Sundays back, and Pastor Brian was sharing, and he gave this picture about accusation. It's like you walking into a room which has no windows and just has one door, and the door is locked. You're there. You cannot get out. That's accusation. On the other hand, when God convicts us, oh, he speaks the truth. When the devil accuses us, he speaks the truth as well. He says, you did this. But he also adds to it. When the Holy Spirit convicts us, he speaks the truth. It's painful. He says, you know, what you've done is wrong. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit provides a way out. It's like being in a room which has an exit. And God says, you know, you need to go through this. You need to go out this way. This is, these are the options that you have. He doesn't lock the room. So Satan keeps us in that room of accusation, and it's like a prison. He keeps us there so that we can be immobile and ineffective. And Satan also deceives us. That's another strategy that he uses. Deception deceives us. If we deceive ourselves into thinking that, hey, I cannot come out of this particular room, even if the door is open, we will not walk out. Right? That's deception. If I'm somehow convinced in my mind that this room does not have these exits, I will be, I will be stuck here. And sometimes Satan, Satan does that. He brings, us, he brings us to that place of deception by saying, there are no options. You cannot move out. And when we buy into it, we cannot. So Satan uses these strategies to keep us in prison or to impen us. And sometimes we are imprisoned by our own wrong choices. You know, we went out, we, we are people who have free will. So we make a choice. It wasn't a very well discerned choice, but we made that choice. We made that decision. And as a result of it, we might be in a circumstance, we might be in a situation which might be like a prison. 
and we are trying to get out. Right? And when we look at the Bible, you know, we see many people who were in prisons. Many people. Uh, can you name some? Joseph, yeah, the first person comes to mind. Joseph was in prison. Who else? Paul and Silas. Paul, many times in prison. The prophet Jeremiah, he was in prison. Peter was in prison. Sorry, Daniel, yes, he was in the lion's den. So, so we know. Samson, okay. So when we look at all these people, when we look at some of their lives, we learn something very, very valuable. You know, if I am in a prison today, if I'm in a circumstance or a situation which I'm finding very difficult to come out of, what do I do in that place? You know, we're going to look at some people who were in prison in spite of doing the right thing. They did the right thing, but yet they were imprisoned. And we're going to look at their lives and see what they did while they were there in that place. What do they do? What do they say? What was their outlook on life? How do they look at God? How do they look at themselves? So let's turn to Genesis chapter 39. And uh, Genesis chapter 39 and verse uh, 21. We're going to look at the life of Jesus. Uh, sorry, Joseph. 39, and uh, let me read from verse 20. It says, Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Now we know the story. We know that he was there for no fault of his. Right? He was falsely accused. He did what was right. He did what was righteous. And yet he was put in prison. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Can we hear an amen? The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. I mean, that's a great picture. Now, we might be thinking, oh, I'm in this circumstance. I'm in this situation. It's so difficult. It's so painful. I've been doing the right thing. I've been saying the right thing. Yet, I'm here. But the good news is this, that the Lord is with us. In that situation, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with me. As the Lord was with Joseph in that very prison, he was there for no fault of his. He was in that situation for no fault of his. But the Lord was with him. And the Lord is with us today in those difficult circumstances. In those difficult situations where the walls are looming so high, where we try so hard to get out of that, the Lord is with us. And because his, He is with us, His presence is with us, His favor is with us, His mercy is with us. Amen. Let's never forget that. You might be facing a difficult situation. The Lord is with me. And because He's with me, His favor is upon me. His mercy is upon me. And we see something happening here. The Lord has been faithful. He is there with Joseph. And we see that the, the keeper of the prison commits to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. He gives him responsibility. He trusts him. It says here, he did not look into anything that was in Joseph's hands. He did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, which means he trusted him. In a prison, he trusted Joseph. And he, and he saw that whatever Joseph did, he prospered. Amen. And it's an amazing place because you have God's favor. You have God's mercy when you're there. 
in that difficult place. So we see that the, the authority, could, the prison authority could trust him. And we move on to, um, we want to see, when we see these uh, verses, we see that Joseph excelled in what he did under those circumstances. You know, so the question to us is this, you know, we might be in difficult circumstances which seem like prison, which seem like there's no way out, but are we being faithful to what is committed in our hands? Are we being faithful to what we are supposed to be doing? He did whatever he was supposed to be doing. He did it well. The Bible says he excelled in it. You know, there's every reason to say, I'm in prison and you want me to carry out these responsibilities, I'll just do the bare minimum. That's it. I'm angry with the world. I'm angry with people. I'm angry with the authorities. I'm angry with God. Why am I in this place? But you see Joseph excelling in what he did. That was his outlook on life. That was his outlook on what was committed to his hands. Let's move to uh, chapter 40 and verses 6 to 8. And Joseph, Joseph came into them in the morning. Now, when we read verse 5, we see that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, they were also put in prison. And uh, both of them, uh, each man's dream in one night, uh, they had a dream and uh, they were troubled. Verse 6, Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. Verse 7, so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him, in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? Verse 8, And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpret interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. We see something very interesting here. Joseph comes in. He's in charge of these prisoners. The prisoners are here. And Joseph notices that they are sad. I wonder how you can do that in a prison. You know, in a prison, everybody's generally feeling low. Everybody's, you know, not in the best of moods, I guess. But Joseph comes and he notices something. He sees that these guys are sad. He doesn't stop there. He said, okay, what you, we all have problems. So what you have is your problem, you deal with it. He doesn't say that. He says, why is it that you look sad? Tell me. Amazing outlook. He is in a difficult situation. He is going through issues of his own. But he's looking at the others. And it's almost like saying, so gentlemen, what can I do for you this morning? You know, what do you do with a guy like that? You know, I imagine Joseph to be a very cheerful, you know, whistling and, you know, just bouncing and just going around and doing the things that he's supposed to be doing. I just imagine him to be like that. And sometimes, you know, we have such people, right? We're going through some stuff and people are just humming and mm -hmm, as if nothing is, you know, going wrong. But there could be a lot of things going wrong in their life. And we see Joseph like that. He's saying, so gentlemen, today what will it be? What can I do for you? And the thing is this, they tell him their problems and he goes on to minister the gift that God has given him in that circumstance. You know, to each one of us, God has given us a gift. He has anointed us. He has called us. And there are times in our lives, there are circumstances in our life where you feel, God, this is not the time for it. This is not the time to minister. This is not to help. Give the other person a helping hand. I am going through stuff in my life. I am neck deep in stuff in my life. This is not the time. But we see Joseph faithfully ministering that gift that God had given him and giving the glory to God. He says, do not interpretations belong to God. Amen. Amen. So he, even in that situation, we, we learn that he ministers, he ministers, he helps. So the focus is not on his need. The focus is on 
others in that situation. He sees others and he sees, hey, what can I do to help you? And I believe we can learn something very, very valuable here because we know that God is with us in that situation. We know that his favor is there. We know that his mercy is there. We know that we have received the anointing. We have the gift of God in us. So despite the circumstance, can we step out? Despite the situation, can we, even in that situation, can we step out and minister in the grace of God? And we see that he's faithful. He remains there for two years. And then he's moved from that prison to a place of praise. There comes an opportunity. There comes a time when the Pharaoh needs interpretation. And suddenly, the fellow prisoner remembers and he says, hey, there was this guy in prison. And so they call him and he interprets. He's faithfully ministering that gift even there. And he speaks, the, 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 he gives the interpretation. And he's moved from the prison to the palace. He goes from that place of captivity. He moves there to the place of praise. Amen. We see this in Joseph's life. And so also in Jeremiah's life, Jeremiah chapter 37, he's in prison for no reason, but because he prophesied. He received the word of God, he spoke it faithfully, and he was put in prison. And the word that he received was this. The land was under siege, and he went and he prophesied saying, surrender and your lives will be saved. But the army was saying, you know, how this guy is going around saying like this, he's actually weakening our hands, so let's put him in prison. So they put him in prison. He could have lost his life, but he received, he remained true to the word that he received from God. He, he got that instruction from God. The situation was not the best of situation, it was not the best of times, but even in that situation, he remained true to what God had instructed him, what God had asked him to do. And then we look at people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3. They face a similar situation, a very difficult situation. In front of them is the fiery furnace. Behind them probably is the image that the king had erected. And the king is there, and he's asking them, what will you do? If you do not bow down, you need to be thrown into the furnace. And then they reply to the king, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17, uh, verse 16 onwards. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not... Let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They did not blame God for this. They passed in their faith. They faced this furnace, and then they said, you know, we will worship God. He will deliver us. And verse 18, this is how it starts. Even if not, even if that deliverance does not come, we will stay true to that conviction because we've experienced that truth. The prison can actually wear us down. Wear us down. It can actually shake the very roots of what we stand on, what we believe in. The, real, the very foundations can be shaken. But here is something that we learn that even in such a place, we can stand our ground. And remain true to what God has done in us. Remain true to that conviction that he's given us. We go to Daniel 6 and we see Daniel in the lion's den. And the same thing happens. The decree has been passed that man cannot bow down to any other deity. But he does that. He does what he has been doing all, his, all these days. He goes he doesn't do it in secret. He just opens the windows and he bows down and he prays to the living God. There's no change in their understanding of God. 
There is no compromise in their theology. They are very strong. They stay grounded. Even if that prison is rocking, is trying to rock that very bedrock of faith that they are standing on, they say, no, no, no. We will remain true. We have experienced God. We have heard His voice. He has led us. There is no question of compromise. And we look at Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. And this is, you know, this is one of my favorites. Acts chapter 16 and verse 23. Verse 23 says, And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight. You know, can we say that together? But at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying. But at midnight, after being whipped and after having their feet put in stocks, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. And then the next few words are even more astounding. And singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They were praying and singing hymns to God. You know, have you asked yourself, how can I pray and how can I sing in such a situation? I think the answer is this. In whatever circumstance that we might be in, you know, God does not change with circumstance. Who God is remains the same. The truth about who God is remains the same. And they were singing to this unchanging God who is the truth. They were singing to this, this God who doesn't change with circumstance or degree of difficulty. They were singing to him. They were, pray, they were praying and they were singing hymns to him. The circumstances were very difficult, but God does not change with that circumstance. So they knew that our God is the same. What he said is what he said. Who he is is who he is. And therefore, I can sing praise. And therefore, we can sing praise no matter what situation we are in, no matter what prison we could be in. We could still sing praise to God. And when we do that, something amazing happens. We read that there is deliverance. The prison gates fall. The prison walls fall down. And, and when we look at verse 30 and 32, you know, the prisoner, he's about, the, the, the keeper of the prison, he's about to kill himself because he thinks that the prisoners have fled. And, uh, but Paul says, you know, do yourself no harm. Verse 30, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's his question. He has heard the singing. He's heard the praying. He knows the situation that they are in. Now the prison doors are open. The walls are down. He comes to Paul and Silas. And the first thing on his mind is, I want what you've got. That thing that you were singing about, the person to whom that you are praying, I want what you've got. And that is what God can accomplish in and through us in those difficult circumstances. You know, some circumstances are, you know, it's not fun. It's not the best of times to sing a happy melody. But we can sing and declare who God is because that doesn't change. That doesn't change at all. And when we sing and declare and agree with the word that this is who God is, then that will be a witness and testimony to those outside. And it brings about a change in destiny in the life of the jailer. Not only his life, but in, the house, in his household as well. A change, complete change in destiny. They all accepted the Lord. They all received the Lord. And that can happen in our lives. We might be in a prison. We might be going through the toughest of circumstances. But when we choose to declare... And praise God for who He is, irrespective of, you know, what we feel. If we don't go by feeling, if we, go, if we don't sometimes go by the facts, but if we go by the truth, 
You know, sometimes facts, facts can say something, but the word of God, the truth, can say something else. There could be a difference. So if we go by the truth, if we declare the truth, if we praise God for the truth, then we will see and we will see the hand of God. And this is what we see happening. It changes. It, it results in the change in destiny of a whole family. So I just want to close with this. You know, we might be in different prisons. We might be for no fault of ours. But don't, lo don't lose hope in that prison. Do not grow weary. Because the one who liberates us, it is not his will and plan to keep us in that place. He wants to take us from that place of captivity to freedom. Amen. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And that's the mission, that's the assignment, and that's the, that's, that is the truth that the cross is declaring over us today, that we have been set at liberty because of the finished work of the cross. So his plan is to take us from captivities, take us from that prison and bring us to that place of praise. But it's very important what we do in the process, what we do in the time when we journey from the prison to the place of praise. So let praise start in the prison itself. Can I say that? Let praise start in the prison. Amen. And as we move on, we will come to that place of praise. And praise will continue when the walls of the prison have come down. Praise will continue when the doors of the prison are broken. And it will continue. And it will be a testimony and it will be a witness for the world outside. And it will result in changed destinies, transformed lives. Because we remain true. And I want to say this with all sensitivity and, you know, I know the pain that we go through when we are in such prison-like situations. Sometimes prisons are a place of reform. I'm not saying that you know, God has put you in that place because he wants to teach you something. No, no, maybe we made those choices. But God wants to take us out, but he wants to change us in that place. Because in that place we will not be doing harm to others and to us. We are captive, but strangely, it is a place of refuge. Strangely, it is a place where we can receive from God. It is a place of reform. And I don't say that you know, very lightly. I say that with the pain that we might be going through. It is difficult, but sometimes it is a place of reform. And the God who, who wants to bring in that change and transformation in us, in that place, he wants to move us out where we can walk in freedom. And Isaiah chapter 40 it talks about they that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. They will walk, they will run, and they will soar. Amen. Amen. So in the process, let's continue to proclaim who God is. Like we read in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, and we see that though the situation might be very bleak, there's no cattle, yet I will joy in the Lord, the prophet says. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Before that, he says, hey, the fig tree does not blossom. There's no fruit on the vines. The labor of the oil, of olive may, f may fail. The fields are yielding no food. He, said, he says, yet I will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. And that praise and that worship is precious in the eyes of God. As God says, a broken and a contrite heart, I will not despise. Now sometimes, is it okay to cry out to God? Yeah. Is it okay to 
you know, just cry and say, God, I'm hurting so much. I'm hurting badly. You know, when we read the book of Psalms, I believe 70% of it is lament. Lament. Oh, God, see what I'm going through. 70% of it is lament. So lament is good. As long as we do not criticize or talk about God in a negative light. As, we do, as long as we do not change the truth of who God is, what He's declared Himself to be. 70%, can you believe that? Of course, we read the Psalms and we say, oh, I will enter His gates with thanksgiving. But 70% of that is cry. It's a lament. It is okay. In fact, uh, when the Lord Jesus was on the cross, do you know that He used a psalm? Psalm 22 and verse 1, right? Oh God, oh God, why have you... First? That is a lament, that is a psalm that he quoted on the cross. So it is okay. It is okay to go before God and pour out and say, God, this prison is too much. But always keep in mind that God wants you out of that place. He will move us out of that place of captivity and bring us to that place of praise. Amen? Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to pray. I just request you to stand up, please. And I just want you to make that choice this morning. Let's call the worship team and uh, let's just um, let's worship the Lord and minister unto the Lord. You might be going through pain. You might be going through some you know, uh, a difficult situation. But you know, can you make that decision? Can you make that choice and say, God, you know, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. This is not going to change my picture of, Lord, who you are. You are who you said you are. And as your word says, he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. And so, God, this morning as we come, we come like those diligent seekers. Yes, Lord, we believe that you are who you said you are. We believe, O oh God, that you are all that you said you are, O oh Master. And God, that you are a rewarder, O Master. That you are to proclaim liberty to the captives. And O God, we come, O Master. We come to that place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and just talk to God. Just tell the Lord. Maybe it's a long time. Maybe you kept all that pain, you know, subdued inside. Just go and talk to God. Tell Him how you really feel. There's no need to put on a mask. Oh, He knows it already. Oh, yes, God. Thank you. Shame and take care. Let's just lift our voice to Him. Oh, blessed be your name, oh God. You are the one who God, takes us from the prison to the palace, oh God. You are the one who takes us, who leads us on that path, oh God, from the prison to the place of grace. Hallelujah. We thank you, oh God. Yes, oh Master Lord. And I believe that, you know, some of us, we need to make some choices in life. Maybe we need to let go of things. We need to hold on to God. You know, we are in those prisons of fear, maybe. Let the truth of God's word dominate your thinking. Let that be on the pedestal. Nothing else. The truth of what he said. He says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. You know, every situation, He is there. So what do we have to fear? You know, he will take us through. Amen. He will take us through. And we will come out like gold. And maybe it is something like a, something that is hardened bitterness or anger or rage. And we need to make those choices. And say, God, I'm willing to walk down that path. That path of freedom. I'm willing to let my mind be renewed. I'm willing to change my thinking. I'm willing to change the way I look at people. I'm willing to change, O oh God. We bless your name, O oh God. We bless your name, O oh God. I just want to call Steve to come and pray and close. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for the Rhema word. Thank you, Lord, for the now word that you brought us through your servant. 
Father, we will not just be hearers of your word, Lord, but doers. We will come out, Lord, of every present situation and we will praise you, Lord. We will lift up your name and we will truly live in that freedom that Christ has set us free. Yes, God. It was for freedom that Christ set us free and we will live in freedom, God. All the days of our lives. And we will be channels of God's blessing. Yes, God, with that anointing of the Holy Spirit that is upon us. We will be, oh Lord, channels setting many captives free, bringing liberty to those who are in bondage still, Lord God. We will be channels of God's blessing. Thank you, God. Thank you for a fresh release of your anointing upon us, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified as we, your people, live in freedom and become channels of God's blessing to bring freedom into many lives. Right from this moment on, all the days of this week ahead of us. We thank you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord surround you with His favor. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you His peace. In Jesus' name. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.